to Cyber Focus, your source for international business information. I'm your host, Ryan Craven, and our guest today is Andrew Ranke. Andrew has been exporting for over 25 years. Upon graduation from Wabash College, he received a Governor's Fellowship from Governor Robert D. Orr, followed by a position with Indiana Department of Commerce as a field representative. Shortly after finishing his MBA, he worked as an export manager for Trantex Incorporated and earned an Exporter of the Year Award from the St. Joe County Chamber of Commerce. Following his tenure at Trinitex, Andrew founded Foreign Targets Incorporated, an export development company that creates and manages proactive export programs for small and medium-sized organizations. Andrew was appointed to the U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Indiana District Export Council, and is a member of the various trade organizations, including the Indianapolis Foreign Trade Zone Board, the Indy Chamber's Go Global Council, and Exodus Refugee. He served as president of the Michiana World Trade Council, and later the World Trade Club of Indiana. Andy, thanks for being here. All right, Andy. Well, I think we'll start off with uh, kind of that first question that that I always have when we're talking about exporting in in Indiana. Um, when I think about exporting, you know, I tend to picture the big, you know, East Coast and the West Coast hubs, um, but that's not necessarily just the case. And so, um, I'd love to hear your input on just kind of exporting and and how does Indiana fit into all of that. Sure. Well, I appreciate being here, uh, Ryan. And, and uh, yes, it uh, actually Indiana posted a record high uh, last year in 2019 of $39.4 billion, uh, which is a slight increase in exports, which counters uh, much of the Midwest and the country uh, at large. The country had a slight decrease in exports, uh, but Indiana was one of three, just three Midwestern states that posted a, an increase. And uh, so that's, that's good, especially because of the headwinds that we've had. Both in Indiana and the U.S., we had a strong dollar, uh, and we also had increased trade friction worldwide, from China to Japan, uh, Europe uh, to the Americas, uh, even emerging countries like India and Turkey. So uh, that, that's, that's good news. Uh, the, our top markets for the state uh, were Canada, Mexico, Japan, China, and Germany. Those are the top five, and the other five were all also in the EU. Uh, those are our top 10. And our top exports from Indiana were transportation equipment, uh, chemicals, uh, machinery, miscellaneous manufactured uh, goods and pharmaceuticals, uh, and medical equipment. Don't forget the Fort Wayne area is the world's leading supplier of prostheses. And uh, also we had uh, plastics is a big part of that export picture. And of course that's big in the Southwest section of the state in Evansville. Great, yeah, that's fantastic information. Um, you can you speak to a little bit on, on why, on your opinion on why um, Indiana kind of had that growth or saw that growth? Well, we, we increased, believe it or not, we countered the U.S. Uh, trend. We increased trade to China and Japan, uh, uh, and, I, and I know uh, transportation equipment was strong, pharmaceuticals was strong, uh, so I think some of our mainstays as a country, as a state, uh, fared better uh, slightly than the rest of the country. We're, uh, we're the most manufacturing intensive state of all 50 states. So that may also have had a, a, a play in that number. Uh, our products manufactured in the state uh, found homes overseas. And if you think of Indiana, we're actually the 16th, about the 16th largest state economically for, in terms of GDP, but we're actually 13th in exports. So we punch above our weight as a state uh, on the national uh, national scene. We also act, actually export, uh, out export California on a per capita basis, uh, which is fun to think about. They've got about, I think, 130, 120 billion dollars worth of exports. We have about almost 40 billion. They have about, uh, I think, 40 uh, million residents. We have about six and a half million. If you do the math on a per capita basis, we substantially out export uh, a state that is uh, has a huge coastal line and sits on the Pacific. So kudos to Indiana. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
you know, in the, I know the current situation offers a, a host of challenges for businesses um, across the world, across the state. Um, you know, why should companies be looking at, you know, exporting now? Well, it's a good question, uh, especially during this, these days of the pandemic and, and global fears and economic fears. But this current environment is specifically why you should develop foreign markets, why you ought to have, if you can, uh, not all country companies uh, make sense to have an export strategy, but if, you've, uh, if you can, you ought to look towards the export market for diversification. Uh, companies that export are far more likely to stay in business uh, during times of economic downturn than those that don't. Uh, and, and the reason for that is diversification. You take advantage and you, you diversify your, your investments, your stock portfolio, your bonds. You don't have everything in, in bonds or stocks. You don't have any, everything in utilities or uh, the bank stocks or uh, IT. You, you certainly don't want to have all your your, your your business tied to the domestic economy because it will, it's not when, it's not if, it's when the U.S. economic engine goes into recession, and it does. We always see that. We haven't seen it for 10 years, which is uncharacteristically uh, good for the United States, but we do have economic downturns, and exports soften that blow. Uh, the U.S., uh, we only have 4% of the world's inhabitants and about a quarter of its of its wealth and buying power. Uh, and don't forget, two thirds of the growth of the U.S. GDP in 09 and 10 was because of increases in U.S. exports. U.S. export growth after the after the recession of 08 powered largely powered America's resurgence. So it's always good to consider uh, forging those those export ties and, and putting together a proactive export strategy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when I think of, of exporting again, uh, not being super familiar with, with that realm, um, you know, my mind tends to go to larger companies, um, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, you know, really kind of who should be thinking about exporting and, and, you know, you mentioned some of the benefits, but. Right. Uh, if, and that's a good question because a lot of times you have uh, companies that are newly formed that look at the foreign market uh, and perhaps they ought to wait until they're more, have a, a larger solid foundation and a footing in the domestic arena. But sometimes it does make sense to at least consider those foreign markets, especially if you've, you're developing a product and you want to consider alternate markets to go into as you develop that product. Uh, but basically, I think if a company is, uh, has a solid footing in the domestic arena, if they've had, uh, uh, they, they know their competitive advantages and, and know where in the world their competitive, competitive advantages can transfer the best, uh, it, it makes sense to look at those foreign markets. Um, uh, I, I, th I think... You know, the, there's a misnomer a little bit that the United States and Indiana is uncompetitive. Uh, we, we have a, a, a sense that if it's made in the United States, it's too high priced. And therefore, we're not sure if we should look into the foreign markets. But if, if you look at the World Economic Forum in Geneva, Switzerland, it's a think tank. Um, that's the organization that has those Davos meetings in January that world leaders and business leaders go to. They rank the world, the countries of the world, in terms of competitive strength. Uh, and they, you know, the financial strength, the innovation and capability, innovation capability, uh, intellectual property protection, the infrastructure, the, the talent and workforce, uh, and, and the, the strength of its uh, financial markets. And the U.S. ranked second this past year of all the nations. Uh, I think the only nation to rank above us was Singapore. But uh, generally, we rank first, second, or third on that list, very high up and far out ahead of our economic rivals, China, Japan, and Germany. Uh, I think this year, Japan ranked uh, sixth, Germany ranked seventh, and China ranked 28th in that list. So there's more that goes in 
to the competitiveness of a nation uh, more than just wage rates. There's a host of indicators that make this country and this state very competitive. Yeah, thank you for sharing that information. Um, again, I just, when I think of exporting, I don't think of Indiana and and just kind of in our relationship with you and and learning new uh, new things and and whatnot. Uh, that's clearly clearly not the case, and it's um, humbling to see that. So, yeah. Um, so you've been in kind of the export sector for you know over twenty five years. Um, you know, do you have any success stories that you're particularly proud of that you're uh, willing and able to share? Uh, sure. Uh, I there was a. I often use a, 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 a tactic called benchmarking. It's not really that, that uh, complex, but, you, but when you're looking at foreign markets, you tend to look at countries that can use your product um, that you've already identified through due diligence, primary and secondary research to say, yeah, those are the countries or that's the country we want to go into. Uh, years ago, we identified a company I represent up in Wisconsin, uh, a would make power distribution equipment and basically making the electricity and the distribution of electricity more uh, more efficient. And we realized that a, a large section of the world that was building out its infrastructure, building out its grid, was the Middle East. So we made a, a plan to attend a Middle East trade show in Dubai. And ahead of that, we did a lot of due diligence, and I called a couple of, and I was, we, we, we had our, already some contacts in the country. We took a look, look at what, what companies would be, and distributors and reps would be exhibiting or attending that trade show. Uh, but we also did, I did something called benchmarking. We contact companies that make a complementary product to yours to see where, where in the world they're going and what distributors and what reps they have in that area. Um, and it, 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 it's a simple process, but uh, I called another company that we work with in the U.S. on bids and that I work with on foreign tenders from Vietnam to Brazil to the Middle East, uh, and they make the controller, uh, and our products were the capacitor banks, the capacitor switches, and, uh, the, and we comprised the, the device with switches and capacitors and, and uh junction box rack and the product that we benchmarked with was the controller which is kind of the brains of the system uh, and it makes sense and found out ahead of that trade show where uh, what what foreign markets in the middle east were strongest for them and most importantly what distributors and reps they used and it makes sense if they're selling the capacitor controller they probably need the capacitor bank so it was a simple simple tool but you'd be surprised how many companies don't do that or don't think of that. And so we made the introductions, we made up, we, we met with them in Dubai and, and visited their offices in, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and uh, signed them up as our distributor. And they've been a great partner and, and we made sales into the UAE and Oman. So that's that's one uh, one success. And, and I, keeping in line with what we are seeing today with the pandemic, with the economic recession. Another reason why you want to have export markets is it, at the time of the last recession, 08, 09, 2010, exports of that power distribution equipment uh, uh, helped keep the lights on. Um, and, I, and, I, and they maintained, they maintained business. Um, and the reason is that it, it is, in the U.S., the power distribution banks were being sold to uh, utilities that are investor or shareholder owned. So they would be pulling back to keep their profits up. It makes sense. In foreign countries, especially in emerging markets, uh, they aren't shareholder uh, driven. They are publicly owned. So it was used by the public entities and their governments as a stimulator to keep the economy going. So our products still went through much of the emerging country uh, following the following that economic downturn. Uh, and we also, I don't know if we have time, but it, it's a fun, it's a fun story. Uh, I developed foreign markets for some wineries out in California. And I didn't know that much about wine, but my business partner did, that was his background. 
and I knew how to do the export research and find out the best markets in the world to go for those small wineries in California. And uh, this is years ago, but we partnered up with Paul Meyer, Diamond Creek, uh, Kistler, and uh, Paul Meyer, Diamond Creek, and Philip Tony. Four very rather small boutique, very high end, very highly ranked by Robert Parker uh, for for their wine and and wine aficionados. So we went out to California, interviewed those wineries, uh, got a sense of where they wanted to go and what they've done in the past. We did the research, found that China, Hong Kong, and some of the Pacific Rim made sense to target because they had the fastest growth for American wine exports and uh, did the due diligence, finding out where in the foreign markets you want to go, target a country or two at first, and, and plan to visit those countries. So once we had a portfolio of wineries in hand, uh, we went to China to interview and do the ground research on the best distributors there. Uh, ahead of that trip, I called the U.S. Foreign Agricultural Service in Beijing and Shanghai, and anybody can do that. Uh, they have people that are, are sector proficient in, in, for instance, wine. So we made interviews with those, uh, with, with uh, a lot of the distributors, identified the top five or six, set, set up interviews with them, and also went to the high-end restaurants that would be buying this wine and, and uh, resorts and asked to speak to their sommeliers and found out what wines they buy, why. So it was a whole cadre of research, but it made the end result was finding a fantastic partner that well suited for those wineries uh, in Summergate. So we, we partnered with them and, and had, had some, some great success there. Uh, thank you. Um, your story kind of helped prompt me with another thought or a question. Um, kind of in your experience of doing the groundwork, doing the research, um, you know, finding the markets. Um, how important um, is that cultural connection or that cultural uh, competency uh, skill? It is, it's important. Americans don't often think of it. It's weird because our country is, uh, is comprised of uh, all nationalities, all peoples of earth. Um, but we are sometimes lax in taking into account that, uh, that cultural nuance, and it's important. Uh, looking at, at Asia and parts of India, there's kind of a, a top-down approach where you have to uh, pay homage to that, that, you, that there's a hierarchy in doing business, and that in this country, there's not that hierarchy. We call each other by the, our first name, often despite the rank of officer or, or company executive. We're just used to that. We're more informal in that way. And we're inf more informal in our dress, in our interaction. We also expect as Americans to sit down to business and maybe have five minutes of pleasantry talk and then get down to the nuts and bolts. But, you, but not so in Latin America and Asia and even parts of Europe, there's a sense of get, wanting to get to know each other first. And that is a, that's half of the business transaction, is getting to know uh, the country, getting to know your customer, getting to know your partner. Uh, so there's, there's a, the, the cultural, uh, the International Center is a resource here in Indianapolis. It's a great resource for the state that offers training on cultural differences that can help Indiana companies be better placed uh, and adept when they go overseas or when they host foreign visitors. Perfect, thank you. Um, that's actually a, kind of a great segue into, you know, kind of the last question is, um, you know, as an Indiana company you know, is looking to get into exporting or even learn more about it, uh, what are the kind of resources or, you know, where's a good place for them to start? Well, that's a, that's a, that's often the first question. Where do you go for research? Where do you go for resources? Uh, and I would, I, I'm part of the Indiana District Export Council, and I think I'll begin there. Every state in the union has a District Export Council. It works alongside the U.S. Department of Commerce, 
Um, and, and again, every state in the union has at least one. Ours is uh, called the Indiana District Export Council. The website is Indiana DEC for D uh, District Export Council dot org. Uh, and it, it, we're about 24, a couple dozen professionals of different varying backgrounds and industry uh, backgrounds and, and professional backgrounds with, with a, a, the objective of offering our knowledge on trade, on export development to companies throughout Indiana to promote trade, to promote exporting. Uh, and we put on seminars, we put on uh, webinars. I think the next one for us is gonna be Incoterms 2020 which is basically how you, the Inco terms is your terminology of how you interact with foreign customers, uh, what you put on your quote. Um, so, but the Indiana District Export Council, you're, you're uh, uh, approved or selected by the US, uh, uh, US Department of Commerce Secretary for a period of years. And we have a, a list of, of other resources that we can put you in contact with to get started. But there's also the US Department of Commerce here in Indiana. And that's led by a gentleman called Mark Cooper. He's a friend of mine, he's a, a great individual, and I'm sure you probably know him, um, but he's been a staple for in international trade and exporting for a long time. And he heads up the Indiana office of the US Department of Commerce. Uh, and they have what is called the Foreign Commercial Service. And the Foreign Commercial Service as a resource for all companies in, in the state and the country is uh, the Foreign Commercial Service has offices. Uh, they are linked to the US embassies and consulates worldwide. And they have foreign commercial attaches, often foreign nationals that are chosen for their background and prowess in certain industries that match America's export strength. So a lot of times, if you're going into a foreign country and you want to set up meetings, U.S. Department of Commerce Foreign Commercial Service uh, through Mark's office can get, Mark Cooper's office can get you tied into that invaluable resource. So that's one. Another one is the state of Indiana. Uh, Indiana Small Business Development Center, I've got a contract with them that I help their clients uh, do export development. And so the Indiana Small Business Development Center and the and which is housed and partnered with the Indiana Economic Development Corporation has put a lot of muscle in recent years behind export development and preparedness for Indiana companies. Uh, and, and that's welcome news um, and because it should be a partnership between the state and federal levels and localities to help their, their companies develop foreign markets. But the Small Business Development Center has uh, 10 offices throughout the state of Indiana. And I think each of those offices has one export business advisor, export advisor. And I'm one of those export advisors under contract. But that's an excellent resource. Uh, through that, that state agency, you can participate in what's called the Export Indiana Accelerator Program. Uh, and also uh, the Export Tech uh, Program through Purdue Manufacturing and Tent extension partnership uh, both of those both of those tools over roughly a three-month period uh, offer export advisors like myself included mark cooper is one for export tech and we guide you through a stepped approach at putting together a proactive strategic export development uh, objective a plan uh, that's a good resource. But we can also meet with you to find out, they can meet with you to find out, um, and Mark Cooper can meet with you to find out, the District Export Council, what what information you need to get started to find out if you should export and, and what markets are most attractive. And there's also the Small Business uh, Administration, SBA local office for export working capital. There's Export Import Bank to help export receivables so you can offer open terms to foreign countries and foreign companies wanting to buy your products, which is an important asset to have. So again, the District Export Council, I think, is well positioned to help link a lot of those companies to those resources. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I've attended some of those meetings and some of the um, you know, final ceremonies of the last um, accelerated program and 
yeah, the, the just amount of knowledge in that room, the work that had gone in through that program uh, to prepare those organizations was, was amazing and impressive to see. Um, I think that's part of what makes this topic so unique in my mind is, is it, it is a big, somewhat intimidating uh, conversation for a lot of companies to think about, but the amount of resources and, um, you know, drive that can come from this, not just for those companies, but from the state, the national level, all over the place, there is a lot of resources available to, to make this as successful as can be for, for everyone. Yeah, it really is. And sometimes it's daunting. You don't know where to begin. You don't know what resources to go to first. Uh, but those, those offices, I think all of them, can, can be a first good resource, both at you know, District Export Council, uh, Small Business Development Centers, uh, U.S. Department of Commerce, all of them, we all work fairly close, closely together. So they've, uh, we'll be able to uh, tie companies in as needed. Well, Andy, thanks for your time. Um, that's all the questions I have for you. Is there anything else that you'd like to kind of share with our, our viewers? Well, actually, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, and I meant to say this earlier, but you, you talk about the power of export development. And I'm always one to promote exporting uh, because it, it helps diversification. It helps you weather the storms economically during times of economic hardship here at home. But, but some fun statistics to share and offer of where we could be as a state and a country. Uh, I mentioned how competitive we are as a nation. There's no, large, there's no other uh, major economic rival to the United States that has ranked higher than the United States since I've been tracking that World Economic Forum for the last seven or eight years than the United States. So uh, look at Germany. Germany is considered one of the biggest export powerhouses on earth. But they're also not a, uh, a low wage country like the United States. They have a standard of living like us. They have a, uh, an economy very similar to ours in terms of cost of goods. So, but their $4 trillion GDP, uh, we're about $21, $22 trillion in the United States. Of that $4 trillion, nearly half of that amount come from exports. In the United States, it's about two and a half, 2.6 trillion, about 12% of our national GDP comes from exports. Well, if we're as competitive, if not more so than Germany, shouldn't up to 50% of our GDP be coming from exports? And the answer is yes. And can you imagine if what would happen if we were to match, just match Germany's output uh, of their GDP uh, from exports? That would be the equivalent of adding five to seven trillion dollars worth of economic might to the United States annually to our GDP. So that means that it suggests a lot of Indiana and US companies are leaving a lot of market share on the table for others to take. Uh, so that's just a one, one sentiment that we were doing better at, at, in exporting, both as a state and a country. We're about as large of a percentage of exports to the US GDP as we've ever been as a nation. So that's good news. Um, but, but it does bear mentioning, uh, we have a long way to go uh, and, and the success awaits us if we embrace export development. Well, Andy, thanks for, for sharing that information. Uh, I very much appreciate it. Sure, thank you. That's all for this edition of Cyber Focus. Thank you for tuning in. If you have any comments or suggestions for future topics, please let us know at cyber at indiana.edu.